chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about regretful reanimation. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. And tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Sylvester Barzi is myself, voice talent Paul J. McSorley. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our tale this evening is written by Sylvester Barzi and is performed by me, Paul J. McSorley. In this tale, we learn all we need to know about the title of tonight's show, Sometimes Dead is Better. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Adam. When men have it all, they're grateful. When men lose it all, they're vengeful. And a vengeful man is truly no man at all. In the South, there are two main pillars in life. Football and God. Both are staples down here in Georgia. And for my family, both were big business. You see, my pa is Grayson Rhodes, the former head coach for the UGA Bulldogs. So, football was life. My brothers played football, and Ma and I went to every game until she got sick. Come to think of it, when Mama got sick, <laughs> that's when everything kind of blew up. It was cancer, and the bills were piling up. Pa was a hard worker, but his paychecks only went so far. So he came up with other ways to make some money. He started throwing games for a few good old boys some Carrollton Coke dealers that also handled sports betting. They would take the bets and give Pops a call when the action got hot. Then he would call a lot of shitty plays, and we would have a check to pay for another appointment. Everything was golden until the dealers got arrested and thought turning on Pa would get them a lighter jail sentence. It didn't. The judge didn't give two shits about rigged football games, but oh boy, did the fine folks of Georgia care. Pa got fired on the spot and no one would touch him after that. Times got hard. But remember when I said there were two pillars in the South? Well, when football stopped helping, God came to the rescue. Pa started doing this televangelist thing. Touchdown Jesus, he called it. It was to avoid some tax issues he and Ma fell into. Yet... When Pa told those people he gave himself over to the Lord and started praying on TV, it was like all was forgiven. People started sending in checks just to help the church and to be forgiven for their sins. However, sinners can't forgive sinners. That's just not how it works. I'm telling you, we get one of those people on stage, hit them with some holy water, and bam! 
everyone will be talking about how we prayed the evil out of that son of a bitch. Pa said. He nodded and laughed. Well, not a real one. I'm not flying someone in for that. We'll get Carol's kid to dress up like one. How's she doing anyway? I haven't seen her since the party. I listened to his phone call from the living room as I watched people tear each other's throat out on television. There were people killing people and zombies killing people. The world was falling apart and here we were in our big mansion. At times, I'd look at my life and I'd feel sick. Living peacefully while others were dying. I think they call that survivor's remorse? Turn the channel. No one wants to watch this depressing shit. His voice was deep and demanding of attention. I don't think there's a room on earth that my brother wouldn't leave in awe of his demigod-like size. We stared at each other for a moment, then Daniel's hand came flying into the side of my head. From my new spot on the floor, I heard him say, Keep eyeballing me and I'll pop your fucking grape, boy. The war is over, Sergeant. You can put your crazy back in the box, I said softly. I got to my feet to see Pa's smile drop. Ronnie! Ronnie! Hello! Pa shouted. He held the cell phone up, walking toward the window. The fucking call dropped again, he said. I told you this shit's getting real, Pop. People keep foot around it, but when all the fucking hijis start gassing us, then... Daniel's rant was cut short by my harmless question. Were you always racist, or did the Marines make you this way? I asked. Your face is racist, you little brat, he replied. It's not your phone. The whole network is down. The voice of reasoning in our house pulled my attention away from the shell-shocked mountain man to my other brother, Matthew. Shit! I shouted. It might come back, I said. The three of them stared at me until I saw my statement of hope for what it really was, a delusion. America got hit by the virus last. It was only in D.C. last I checked. Every other nation except for those south of the wall were reporting the same thing. People were dying, but they weren't staying dead. Small things like no hot water or no cell service were just an inconvenience before, but now they were signs of some bad stuff to come. Adam, could you please check on Ma? Make sure all her equipment is working right, Matthew said. I looked over at Pa and he nodded slowly. So I made my way upstairs. Being sent away wasn't anything new to me. They used to do it all the time when they were dealing with those drug dealers, sending me off to get milk or mama's medicine. I used to feel disrespected, but I guess they wanted to hide their dark sides from me. Although the one thing I've learned in life is everyone has a dark side. Hey, Ma, I said softly. I didn't expect an answer. Long gone were the days where she would smile and ask me how I was doing. The doctor called it primitive neuroectodermal. I learned that word backwards and forwards, letter by letter. I thought I ought to know just what was killing my mama. Cell phones are down, so no dinner parties tonight. Maybe tomorrow, I said with a smile. I walked over toward the window and softly said, But I'm going to fix you something nice for dinner. She lied there with hazel eyes glued to the ceiling, never acknowledging my words or my presence. She was dying, but I was the one that felt like a ghost, never seen and never heard. I went about checking all her equipment and decided to give her the meds just in case the power went out and I forgot. I spent a good hour talking with Ma. She never answered or looked at me, but she was the only one in the house that ever listened to me. Mama, things... My words were cut short by the sound of pounding on our front door. Quick and frantic booms, one right after the other. I could hear Pa's name being shouted. My eyes went toward the window, and I could see three shadows casting down the driveway. Mixed in with the darkness of those shadows was blood, 
Lots of blood. Mr. Rhodes! The banging got more intense to the point that Pa couldn't avoid it anymore. I heard the door open and voices battling back and forth. I think we have a guest, Ma, I said softly. She didn't even blink. I like to imagine she was playing a trick on me and when I closed the door she would pop up and smile. What the fuck is going on? Pa shouted. I like to imagine we were all better than we truly were. We were at the studio and got overrun by those things. We barely made it out, a male voice said. I listened to his story as I slowly came down the stairs. It was no different than any of the stories I've seen on TV or read about on the internet. The only thing that set this tale apart from the rest was it was in our backyard. I fucking told you, I fucking told you, those fucking ragheads. Daniel got cut off as Matthew stepped in front of him inside. What are you doing here, William? Matthew asked. The tone in his voice carried a hint of concern, but I could tell it was more for us than our guest. William Mills was Pa's head stagehand at the studio. He made sure everything ran smoothly. Always had everything organized right down to the letter. William was muscular. Years of hanging stage lights can do that to you. His shaggy black hair tossed to the side as he rushed in with a hint of a smile that was framed by his pointed goatee. When I first met him, I thought, this is what the devil would look like. I'm not sure why I thought that. William had never been a wicked person. But then again, even the devil was an angel once. William was holding up a bloody mess of a man in his hands. The man's name was Travis. I had seen him around every now and then, but never talked to him, and from the looks of him, I never will. Travis got hurt as we were trying to get out. He Matthew wasted no time listening to William's explanation as he jumped toward the question we were all wondering. Was he bitten? Matthew asked. My brother's eyes were fixed on William. They stared each other down, like two lions battling for a gazelle. Just when I thought their eyes would cut each other in half, I heard her voice. The only real angel I had ever seen. Her name was Ruby. Ruby Mills. She was William's little sister, and even with blood covering her body, she still looked amazing. Would you two cut the shit? He was shot. A bullet clipped him when everyone went nuts. Ruby said, she released her hold on Travis and walked up to Matthew. Now, you gonna help us? Or are you just gonna stand there like some fucking clown? She asked softly. Matthew's jaw tightened and he looked at William. Put him on the dining room table. We'll call a doctor, he said softly. That's very kind of you, Matty boy, William said. Yeah, you're a real saint. Ruby replied. Her and William rushed Travis into the dining room. I stood there, looking at the blood trail through the open door. Then Pa slammed it shut as hard as he could. It's fine, Matthew said. Don't tell me it's fucking fine. Make it fucking fine. Pa hissed and he pushed past me as he made his way up the stairs. Where are you going? Daniel shouted, but the only answer he got was another door slam that echoed through the house. What the hell's that all about? Daniel asked. I'll tell you later. For now, go see if you can help Travis. Matthew said softly. I can tell you right now I can't help him because I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV. Daniel replied. Jesus Christ, Daniel, did the military teach you anything other than how to shoot a fucking... Matthew was cut short by another one of my simple-minded questions. Why did you tell him that we'd call a doctor? I asked. Matthew's head turned toward me, and then he looked at the doorway leading to the dining room. Ruby was standing there with her arms crossed. I'll tell you later. Matthew replied. Ruby's hazel eyes slowly gazed at each of us for a moment, 
before she shoved her hands into her pockets and softly said, We need some towels or something to stop the bleeding. There was a man bleeding to death on our table, but panic or sorrow weren't the emotions that seemed to be filling the air. I looked over at Ruby and she smiled at me. I'll get you some, I said softly. I was a sucker for Ruby's smiles. All of Georgia knew that, especially Ruby. She nodded, turned around, walking back into the dining room, and I ran up the steps to retrieve her towels like the good lapdog I was. When I returned downstairs, I saw my brothers and Pa whispering. No, whispering is too innocent of a term. They were plotting in Pa's office. My footsteps were light as I crept toward the doorway. Freaking out now isn't going to make the problem go away, Matthew said. You shut the hell up with that calm breathing bullshit, Pa snapped back. Lower your fucking voice, Matthew hissed, and his head turned too fast for me to dodge his glare. I was quickly snatched up and pulled into the office with towels in hand. Matthew carefully closed the door behind me. Why the hell's he here? Daniel asked. Because, like it or not, he's part of this, Matthew said. My head turned from side to side as I held the towels closely to my chest. A part of what? I asked. Pa's fingers shot out and he said, Don't you fucking say another word. There wouldn't be anything to say if you listened for once, old man, Matthew said. What the hell's going on? I shouted, and then Daniel's massive arm came around my neck and quickly pulled me down into a headlock with very little protest from myself. I was trying to fight, but my efforts versus his natural and synthetic strength were wasted. Shut up. Daniel said softly as his bicep tightened around my neck. Or I'll shut you up. Let him go, Daniel. Matthew said and the beast quickly released me from his grasp. Matthew leaned on our father's desk as he folded his arms over his chest. We need to get him out of the house. Who? I asked and once the words left my lips, we heard the office door slowly open to reveal William in the middle of the doorway. His eyes were scanning the room as he smiled. This is a real lovely home you got here, Mr. Rhodes. Real nice woodwork, built to last, William said. He slowly walked past the mountain of a man known as Daniel and made his way toward my father's bookcase. He placed his green beer bottle on the stained mahogany wood as his finger ran across the spines of the books. I didn't take you for yingling drinker, William, Pa said, and William laughed as he pulled a black book off the bookcase. Slowly flipping through the pages, he softly said, I'm a whatever's available type drinker, Mr. Rhodes. Then he slammed the book closed. I don't know many people that keep the Bible in their bookcase. I like the Lord close, Pa said. William nodded. Close. To me is my nightstand. But then again, I guess you're not in your bed much these days, William said. Excuse me, Pa said. I mean, a busy man like yourself. I bet you hardly sleep. William said. He tossed the book onto Pa's table and picked his beer up, smiling. After a long swig, he said, That New Testament shit, with all due respect, Mr. Rhodes, I don't know how you can stand up there and spit all that soft crap. William turned his gaze toward me and pointed the neck of his beer my way and he said, The Old Testament, that's the true word of God. You know it is because man feared it. The Lord forgave our sins with... Pa's words were cut short by William's laughter. The Lord doesn't forgive shit. Men change their minds, not God. You think of beings that's all-knowing and powerful just woke up one morning and said, Oh, fuck, I was wrong. 
William shook his head. Nope, men got sick of paying for their sins, so they watered down the Lord's words, thinking that would help them escape judgment. The beer bottle went to his lips one last time and then came down resting on Pa's desk. No one escapes judgment. He looked over at Matthew and smiled. When's that doctor getting here? He asked. Soon, Matthew said softly. William nodded his head and he walked past my brothers and I. Soon, he said to himself as he walked off toward the dining room once again. I looked over at Matthew and his fingers ran through his wavy black hair. We need to do this now, Matthew, Pa said softly. Matthew rolled his eyes. Just give me a fucking second to think, Matthew said. The cool head that ran our little family circus for years was showing an emotion that I only recalled seeing when Ma got sick. Fear. Lots and lots of fear. What's there to think about? Why is he here? Why was he at the studio? Daniel slammed his hands on the desk. Use your fucking head, Matt. He's up to something. Why don't you just ask him? I asked softly. Their heads turned my way, and I felt as if I had just leaped into a burning spotlight. I cleared my throat and did my best to speak with more bass as I said, You want to know why he was at the studio? Just ask him. The three of them stared at one another, and then Matthew nodded. Before I could react, I was being pushed aside as Daniel started storming toward the dining room. William! Daniel shouted, and as if he were summoned from the gates of hell, William appeared with a smile on his face, leaning in the doorway. You bellow, Danny boy? William asked, but this time, the shit-eating grin was bashed into submission by Daniel's massive right fist. I watched as William's body smashed into the floor. He stayed on his back, his eyes fixed on the ceiling for a moment. Then he did something none of us expected. His bloody lips parted, and he smiled. Why the fuck were you at the studio? Daniel shouted. Ruby took a step forward, but William's hand went up. I'm good, William said. His hand went up to his lips and came back with dark red droplets. He sat up and laughed. You got some power behind that rocket, Danny boy. William slowly stood up and rolled his neck. The cracking sound sent a chill through me. I was slowly backing up, trying to retreat from it all, but my mind didn't know that my body was just reacting. But your form is shit. Answer the fucking question, Matthew shouted. William's eyebrow went up. What question was... Daniel rushed toward William. They both moved faster than I expected. Daniel lifted William up in the air. Then they both came crashing down onto the floor. I was sure that was the end of it. But Daniel wasn't getting up. We moved closer to see Daniel's head locked under William's arm. He had my brother all tied up like a pretzel in a UFC cage fight. Let him go! Pa shouted. Break his fucking neck. I heard Ruby whisper. I looked over at her and she winked at me. My body was far too confused at that moment to react. Thankfully, Matthew's own wasn't. He came rushing over with Mama's lamp, but before he could strike, William's hands shot up and Daniel fell to the floor like a dumbbell after your last rep. Be cool, be cool, William said with a smile. He attacked me. I was just protecting myself. He slowly started pushing Daniel's body off. What were you doing at the studio? Matthew asked. You mean, why was I there after y'all fired me? William laughed as he got to his feet. He started dusting himself off and softly said, Why, why do you think I was there? I don't fucking know, Matthew replied. He was cleaning out his locker, you fucking shithead, Ruby shouted. Matthew looked over from Ruby to William and then back at Pa and I. 
We thought... Matthew was cut off by William's laughter. You thought what? That I went over there to shoot up the studio? Go postal on Mr. Rhodes and y'all? He asked, and then his eyes scanned over us. God damn! Why the fuck would I do that? Because y'all fired me? The lamp slowly came down, and Daniel started moving around on the floor. I'm sorry, Matthew said softly and looked over at Ruby. I really am. Ruby glared at him and then rolled her eyes. Her and William walked past me. They got to the front door and William put up his finger. With his back turned to us, he softly said, There's only a handful of things worth killing over, and a job ain't one of them. William's head turned to look at us over his shoulder. Y'all get Travis some help whenever the phones come back on, he said. We all stared at one another. Here we were accusing him of being dishonest, and he knew we were lying the whole time. You don't have to leave, I said, and Ruby laughed as she pulled open the door. William quickly followed behind her. My head turned toward Matthew and I shouted, What the hell was that about? Maybe he doesn't know, Matthew said to himself. There's nothing to know because nothing fucking happened. I shouted. My eyes went back over to Matthew who was helping Daniel to his feet now. We stared at one another for a moment before he softly said, Let it go, Adam. So I did. I stormed off, slamming doors and locked myself away like the kid they always made me out to be. Locked myself away from all their secrets. I rested my head on my pillow, and the next thing I knew, I was asleep. A loud crash jolted me awake. The moonlight was filling up my room and my clothes were soaked from the summer sweat. I sat still for a moment, pulling my head out of dreamland and into the real world. Banging and rustling could be heard coming from below. My white sneakers slid out of bed as I made my way to the door. My fingers went around the knob and I wondered what I was walking into. Was it Matthew and Pa finally having it out about their lies? Did William return for round two with Daniel? Or maybe it was sweet, beautiful Ruby here to burn our house down. I wasn't sure what was below, but I pulled the door open anyway. It made a loud creaking sound that took over the darkness of the upstairs. Then the rustling stopped. Whatever it was heard me, just as I heard it. Matt, I said softly. My rubber soles lightly pressed into the wooden floors and did my best to creep toward the staircase. Dad, I said softly. A loud bang rattled me and I jumped back. What the fuck, shit brick? Daniel's deep voice came from behind me before he pushed me forward toward the staircase. I grabbed the railing in hopes of saving my life. When I turned around, I saw all three of them looking at me. What are you pushing me for? I asked. You stepped on me, Daniel said. Then he folded his arms over his chest. And you didn't call for me? What if I was dead down there? Well, that's a justifiable reason to toss someone down the stairs. Are you sure your steroid dosage isn't too high? I replied, and Matthew laughed, but Pa didn't. His attention was on the situation that was coming from below. Daniel, go get my gun, Pa whispered. Your gun is in your office, Daniel replied. I know that, Pa said. So why the hell would he go downstairs, risk getting shot just to come back upstairs, old man? Matthew hissed. Shot, I shouted. My hand slipped over my mouth. It was a reaction. A very, very bad timed reaction, but a reaction nonetheless. Daniel went to grab me, but I quickly backed up. Another reaction that came at a very, very bad time. We all watched Daniel's 260 pounds of muscle tumble down the wooden staircase, every step sounding off with a chilling thump against his body. Danny! I shouted, and the three of us raced down the steps. 
Daniel was passed out on the floor for the second time today. This time, there was blood pulsing from the side of his head. Fuck, Matthew said softly as he started to check for life in our older brother. He's breathing, so that's... Matthew's words were overshadowed by frantic whispers. Matthew, Pa said. Matt, I followed. What? Matthew replied. When his eyes finally came up, they met a set of dropped jaws and bugged out eyes from Pa and I. We pointed toward the kitchen, and Matthew slowly turned around to see it standing in the middle of the doorway. Travis? Matthew said, puzzled. Travis's head snapped toward us, and we could see his jaw slowly grinding away intensely. Then, his mouth opened wide and a chunk of his tongue fell to the floor. That's when we knew Travis was dead, and in his place stood a zombie. Oh, fuck, Matthew whispered, but the whisper was enough to send the monster into a rage. It moved faster than I thought it would. In seconds, it was upon us. Matthew was doing his best to hold it back, pushing against its snapping jaws with one hand and cuffing the zombie Travis's wrist with the other. It was a position that could only hold long enough for help to arrive. Unfortunately for Matthew, his only possible saviors were Pa and myself. Pa had run to the front door just as quickly as the zombie had moved towards us. As for me, I was frozen in fear. What the fuck? The door's locked! Pa shouted as his fist pounded on the front door. Dad! Matthew screamed. Pa looked over at us and started backing up, and he took off toward the kitchen. You son of a bitch! Matthew shouted. My head spun toward Matthew, and by the grace of God, I found it in me to work up the nerve to run. You too, Adam! I heard Matthew scream from behind me, but I didn't turn around. I was on a mission. Where's the gun? I shouted. I turned to see the zombie's bloody teeth just inches away from Matthew's face. Jesus! I rushed over with the first thing I could get my hands on. My body tilted to the side. My hands came racing forward. I don't know if it was the adrenaline, luck, or the grace of the Lord, but I connected with Pa's massive Bible right into the open mouth of the zombie Travis. We both tumbled over onto the floor. Shit! Matthew said softly. I rolled around with the corpse for a moment. It was strong, stronger than the television let on. But with a quick twist of my hips, I was on top, pressing the Bible deeper into its mouth. I watched as its bloody teeth carved into the black leather cover. My head turned and I shouted, Run! Matthew wasted no time. He dragged Daniel toward the basement door. Zomba Travis gave up biting through the book and then did his best to claw at me. I had no plan beyond getting it away from Matthew. I never had a plan beyond helping my family. Pa, help Adam! Matthew screamed from the basement steps. My head came up to see Pa standing at the basement door. As he crept toward me, I could see the internal battle he was having. His forehead wrinkled and his jaw tightened. Zombie Travis's hand shot up blocking my view and then I heard it. Fuck this! Pa shouted. The battle cry of a coward as he took off down the basement steps. I wasn't an angry person. I believed in turning the other cheek. But at that moment, I wanted nothing more than to get my hands around that old man's neck. I took a deep breath, released the blood-soaked book, and sprinted toward the basement door. Frantic footsteps shattered my every movement. When I made it through the door frame, I spun around and grabbed the door handle. As I pulled the wood toward me, Zombie Travis's ghostly pale hand slapped onto the door. Oh my God! I shouted. My heart was pounding out my chest. I was so focused on the crazed eyes that were staring me down that I didn't hear Matthew coming up from behind me. Eat shit, motherfucker! Matthew shouted. He rammed a flaming mini Christmas tree into zombie Travis's face and I watched as the zombie stumbled back far enough for us to pull the door closed and latch it. Matthew's sweaty hand rested on my shoulder and mine rested on the door. You did good, kid, he said softly. The door started to frantically shake as zombie Travis slammed back and forth between the basement door and the wall. 
the scent of burning flesh started to take over my senses. I covered my face as black smoke pushed under the door. Matthew and I ran down the steps to find Pa kneeling over Daniel. You son of a bitch! Matthew shouted. He started rushing toward Pa, but I wrapped my arms around him and did my best to pull him back. He's not worth it! I shouted. Pa laughed and shook his head. Something funny, old man? Matthew asked. Yeah, you two little clowns. That's what's so funny, Pa said softly. His eyes cut over to us. What do you want me to do, bear hug it? He rolled his eyes and stood up slowly. One bite, one scratch, and you're done. We've seen this on the news. Now isn't the time to play hero. Pa stared at us, and then his lips turned upward into a shitty crooked smile as he said, But you two know that, because... I ain't seen you boys running upstairs with your capes. My eyes went over to Matthew, and then we both looked back at the basement door. In our panicked and fearful state, we forgot the most helpless member of our family was lying upstairs, blissfully clueless to the horrors that were going on below her. Ma, I said softly, and then took off toward the steps. This time it was Matthew's arms that wrapped around me, trying to keep me back. Adam, don't be fucking crazy, he shouted. Ma! I screamed. Adam, calm the fuck. Matthew's words, and everyone's hearts for that matter, were stopped cold by one loud chilling sound. A sound we never expected to hear at that moment. The sound of a gunshot. Ma! I screamed. The gunshot was followed by some light drilling sounds. I stood there. Staring up at the doors, Matthew cautiously started making his way up the steps. Matthew, get your ass down here, Pa hissed. But Matt continued up the steps, one cautious footstep at a time. Matthew, Pa shouted. Listen to your daddy, Matty boy. Cold southern twang came from beyond the door. Then the laughter started. Two sets of it. A man and a woman. Yeah, I wouldn't get too close. I would hate for a bullet to mess up that pretty face of yours. The woman said. William? Ruby? Matthew said softly. Matt's fingers pulled back on the latch, but when he pushed the door, it didn't move. William? The door's stuck, buddy. Matthew said with a laugh. You mind... Boy, I ain't your goddamn buddy. I ain't your pal. I ain't your fucking friend. William hollered. The female voice, which I knew from anywhere, laughed. All the doors and windows are bolted from the outside. We did a little DIY while you all were sleeping, Ruby said. Matthew's fist banged on the door. Open the fucking door, you bitch! Matthew shouted. Oh, Matthew, that's a dirty, dirty mouth you got. Your mama ain't teach you how to talk to a lady? Ruby asked. Sis, that's a job for daddy, William replied. I hope not, because then the whole lot of them are fucked, Ruby said and started to laugh. Mr. Rhodes, William shouted. Can you hear me well enough down there? He asked. Our eyes darted toward Pa. He stood next to me at the bottom step. I elbowed him and he rolled his eyes as he said, Yeah. Good, William said softly. You know, I woke up this morning and I had no plans on ever seeing your shit show of a family again. I said to myself, Self? You are a man with many gifts, many skills. You can do wonders. I wanted to believe y'all firing me was a sign from God to move on and build elsewhere. So why didn't you? Matthew shouted. Because when I went to check on my little sister, to let her know none of this was her fault, that we were given an opportunity to escape your family's prison of a life. 
I found her looping a bedsheet around her neck, William replied. There's very little in this world that shuts Matthew up, but that statement sure enough did. I don't know exactly what it did to me. My heart wasn't racing, but it wasn't still. The only way I can describe it is how a deer must feel. You know, after a hunter shoots at it and it's watching those camo pants coming closer, but it can't move. Then it sees that buck knife and all it wants to do is turn tail and run. All it wants is to be free of that moment. However a deer's heart feels in that moment, mine felt like that on cocaine. Ruby, I had, I had no... My words were cut short by the sound of a gunshot. Matthew bolted down the steps towards Pa and I. Don't you ever fucking talk to her again, William shouted, and the boy and me wanted to run and hide. If I'm honest, the man and me had the same idea. Not you, not your shithead brothers, and for damn sure not that fucking old man down there. We all stood there in silence because no matter what any of us wanted to do, at that moment, we knew William was running the show now. I begged her to come down off that chair. Hell, I threatened her. Told her I could knock her ass into the ER before she could even think of stepping off that chair. William shouted. Then we heard his voice soften as he said, It was all talk. I was scared out of my mind. I didn't want that moment to be our last moment. I didn't want to... All men cry. Bad men, good men, weak men, strong men. We all do it. So I wasn't going to judge William when he did it. Yet while Matthew and I are brothers, we are not the same. The laughter started light at first like a kid in the back of the class, and then it grew. You laughing at me? I pushed Matthew and he pushed me back. No, no one's laughing at you, William, I replied. Only because I felt anyone else's voice would have brought William down those steps, guns blazing. Nothing I said would make her calm down. She was hellbent on killing herself until... William stopped talking. As much as his words were scaring the hell out of me, his silence scared me even more. Until what? Matthew asked, and I was sure that the door was going to fly open and bullets were going to tear us in two, but you don't always need a weapon to tear someone in half. Ruby knew that, and she taught me that. Until he said, we can kill them all, Ruby. Ruby said ever so sweetly. And that's what we aim to do, William said. You two are fucking crazy, Pa shouted. No, crazy is thinking you could fuck someone's world up and then toss them aside like a used condom, William said. I looked over at Pa and he couldn't even look at me. His eyes were locked on the bottom step, like it was going to come alive and save him from all this. This isn't crazy, it's a blood bond. You understand what someone will do to protect their family, right, Mr. Rhodes? Some people lie. Some people steal. Me? I'm part of a rare breed that will kill and die for my blood, William said, and then we heard the door unlatch. It slowly came open to show William and Ruby standing at the top of the steps in full tactical gear. Bulletproof vest, magazine pouches, knee pads... They came dressed for war. William's M4 pointed down at Pa and a red dot appeared on his chest. The question is, what breed are you, Mr. Rhodes? William asked. Ruby's M4 came up and her red dot landed right in the middle of Matthew's head. Because maybe if you were willing to die first, I might let your boys go, William said. If he dies, you'll let us go? Matthew asked. He said maybe, Ruby replied. William laughed and then the two of them took slow steps back before closing the door. Someone has to pay for the sins of this family. 
I want an answer by the morning, William said. Tick tock, Ruby shouted. With that, we heard footsteps, laughter, and then nothing. You son of a bitch! I'll kill you for this! You hear me? I'll fucking kill you! Matthew shouted. Calm down, Matt, Pa said softly, and then Matthew's cannon of rage had a whole new target. I was once again the only thing between Pa and a humbling moment of picking his teeth up off the floor. Calm down, calm down. None of this would have happened if you fucking listened to me in the first place, Matthew shouted. He tossed me to the side and I slammed my elbow into the claw end of an old hammer. They were arguing back and forth, but their words didn't seem to resonate with me. They were just empty shells as my mind focused on one thought. One that echoed throughout my soul until my lips softly released it. What did you do? I asked. My words were ignored by the pissing contest that they were knee-deep in. I was always ignored, always thought of as this second-class citizen who didn't need to know anything more than what he was told. Always taught to never have a voice, so I decided to raise it for once in my life. What did you do? I shouted, and before they could react, I sent that hammer sailing through the air. The blood came quickly. Then came the screaming. I watched as he crumbled down to the floor holding his face. I took a step forward and felt Matthew's hand go on my chest. The cursing never stopped. It went well into the night, but we never checked on him. I sat there staring at the blood rushing from his face as Pa tempted every so often to rip the claw hammer free of his cheek. She came into my office a month ago, Matthew whispered. It had been close to five or so hours since anyone said anything. Pa had stopped crying and was passed out on the floor next to Daniel, his shirt pressed against his cheek to stop the bleeding. I wanted to check on Danny, but I couldn't get over my rage enough to even make a motion toward Pa. I looked at Matthew and he let out a sigh as he continued. Ruby said that the old man got a little fresh one night after drinking. Matthew laughed and shook his head. <laughs> she was telling me my father was a monster and all I was thinking about was what kind of damage control was this going to take. Did he... Did he... I couldn't even bring myself to say the words. You know there's no reasoning with him when he's drunk. I'm sure she did her best to fight him off. Knowing Ruby, I know she fought the whole time. Matthew said and tousled his hair with his fingers before softly saying, I thought looking out for the family was the right thing to do. So I offered her some cash but she declined and said she was going to tell everyone. So we fired her and William before she could. So, that's the sin? That's what all the whispering has been about? I asked, and Matthew nodded before resting his head on the wall. And your damage control was hoping they would just forget about it? I asked. No, I fired them to make them look disgruntled if they ever did say anything send them off with a big bonus or something. It was better than Dad's plan, he said. I didn't ask what that plan was because I already knew. However, as I sat on that cold basement floor facing another long hour in our billion-dollar prison, I thought maybe Pa's plan wasn't that bad. I know God is always watching, but I hoped he wasn't in that moment because I truly believed anything would have been better than letting William live. I'm hungry, I said softly. Oh, I'm starving. The faint words came from the bloody corner of the basement where Pa and Daniel lied. Danny? Matthew said, and we both rushed to his side. The mountain man didn't move. His body was still as he stared up at the light of the basement. My face came into his view, and he closed his eyes. I'm going to kill you, shit brick, Daniel said softly. You're going to have to sit up first, I said. We all laughed and then Daniel's eyes went over toward Pa. He looked back over at Matthew as he said, 
What's up with the old man? He got his face smashed in by a hammer, Matthew whispered. No shit by who? Daniel asked, and I raised my hand slowly. Is no one safe from your terror? He asked, and I sighed, shaking my head. I think we should do it, Matthew said. Do what? I asked. Matthew's eyes came upon me, and no words needed to be spoken. I shook my head and got to my feet. No, we're not doing that, I said. Matthew shot to his feet and shouted, What other choice do we have? You heard William. He might let us go. I rolled my eyes and looked over at Pa. Matthew started walking toward him, and I stood in his way once again. It's him or us, Matthew said softly. I heard Pa shuffling behind me, and then Daniel slowly got up for the first time in hours. I took a step back and shook my head as I softly said, We're a family. Before I got the chance to see the reaction on Matthew's face, the basement door opened and he took off, speeding up the steps. I ran after him, but came to a stop when I saw the barrel of William's M4 rifle being pointed down at us. The red dot found a nice home on Matthew's chest. Back the fuck up, Matty boy! William shouted. The door opened up wider, and Ruby came into view with the large pot in her hands. Unless you're coming up to be the first to die, he asked. I wish, Ruby said. She looked down at me and smiled. Adam, I made you boys some stew. I'll take it, Matthew said softly as he put out his hands. Ruby stared at his palms for a moment before looking back up into his eyes. It's Adam or none of you little shits eat, she screamed. I've loved Ruby pretty much all my life. I knew her favorite color, her zodiac sign, even her shoe size. But I missed the moment when my beautiful angel fell from grace. I wondered how long she was crying out for help with no one answering her. I wondered how many studio sessions she wished she could avoid. How many fake smiles did she have to put on? I slowly started making my way up the steps past Matthew. I came up to the top and Ruby placed the pot in my hands. Then she put a set of spoons on the lid. I did the best I could with what I had, she said. I stared down at the lid for an awkward moment trying to think of something to say. I'm sorry for what they did, I said softly. Ruby's hand rested on mine and she leaned in. As her body came closer, I saw the barrel of William's M4 slowly turn toward me. With one jerk of a finger, he could end my life, and part of me wished he would. But instead of a bullet in my chest, I got a soft whisper in my ear. All we want is him. Ruby leaned back and her soft pink lips brushed along my cheek and sent a chill through me. I was in such a trance that I didn't even notice when they closed the door and locked. I was standing there staring at the lid of the pot. Um, dipshit. You mind bringing the food down? Daniel shouted. I turned slowly on my heels and then started down the steps thinking about Ruby's soft words. Her and Matthew seemed to be on the same dark path. Everyone started digging into the sweet brown stew, but I wrestled with thoughts in my head. The world was changing. It was getting colder, but that didn't mean we had to get colder with it. We could stand our ground and figure something out, or... We could stumble in the dark with the rest of the world. I watched as my father took a bite of a large chunk of meat. His eyes didn't dare meet any of ours. We were family. We could make it through this. That's what I wanted to tell myself, but even if we could, Ma couldn't. Ruby and William had no idea when she needed her shots or when it was time to change her bags. The longer we stayed down here, the more likely she was going to die up there. With that one thought, I stepped into the darkness. Ruby says all they want is Pa, I said softly. The spoons stopped their frantic shoveling of stew, and everyone's eyes fell onto me. Everyone but Pa, who kept his gaze on the floor. We give them Pa and they'll let us go, I said. There were no words, just empty stares at one another. 
I don't know how you could form words for that kind of moment. Pa slowly started to get to his feet, and Matthew did the same. So, that's how it's gonna be? Pa asked softly. He looked at Matt, and Pa took a step back and shook his head. No, no, that's not happening. Not after all I've done for you. For all of you, he shouted. Matthew looked at me, and I shifted my jaw for a moment before I looked at Pa's bloody face and softly said, It's your sin. You should have to answer for it. With that, Matthew and I rushed forward toward Pa. He backed up as far as he could till his back was against the wall, and like any cornered animal, he fought. I took his first hit, right to my jaw, and went down fast. Matthew took one to the arm, but he fired back with a blow to Pa's gut. I watched as Matthew unloaded fist after fist on the old man. Years of resentment and anger finally finding a way free from his body. There's no telling how many things he had to cover up, how many lies he had to tell to keep Pa above water. For years, the old man was drowning in his sins and he was pulling Matthew right down along with him. I got to my feet and joined in. Daniel didn't say a word as my white sneakers started to turn red from the blood. I sent each kick flying into his already pummeled face. Bones cracked. Screams were heard. Tears were shed from all sides. I turned and picked up the hammer off the floor, but then Matthew's hand came out toward me. That's enough, Matthew said. I dropped the hammer and listened to the metal echo through the basement as the head hit the floor. We got down low and lifted our bloody mess of a father off the ground. One shaky step after another, we made our way up to the basement door. Just sit him up, Matthew said softly, and we did. I stared at the red balloon that was once his right eye socket, and I bit my lip as I said, I'm sorry, Pa. I heard a gurgle come from his mouth as a stream of blood pushed from his lips. I stood up and pounded on the door. Then Pa's hand shot up, grabbing a hold of my neck. My eyes came down to see a small bit of hazel staring back at me. His fingers tightened around my neck. I could feel his nails breaking into my skin. My Adam's apple had no room to move. I was choking. The last bit of energy he had in him, he was using it to kill me. I felt a sudden rush of pain in the back of my eyeballs as my head started to fall back. Just when I thought I was a goner, the basement door opened up and William slammed the butt of his rifle into Pa's head. His hand fell and I went tumbling back into Matthew's open arms. We watched as they dragged Pa into the house and slammed the door locking it once again. You all right? Matthew asked. My hand rubbed along my neck and I nodded. But I wasn't all right. Who could be? I had just turned over my father to a pair of psychos in hopes of saving my own life. I beat my father till he couldn't stand and his last memory of me might be of him wanting to kill me. I turned around and started down the steps as I softly said, I'm all right. We all sat around the stew and started eating once again. It had been a few hours since we last saw Pa or anyone from the other side of that door. While a few hours isn't much time in the normal world, we were far past normal at that point. We gave up Pa in hopes that Williams, maybe, was closer to a yes than a no. They're not going to let us out. Matthew said softly. No, they have no reason to keep us down here, I replied. They got 20 to 25 years of reason, shit brick. They don't want to go to jail over this, Daniel said. There aren't any more jails, I said. Why, because we saw one fucking zombie? For all we know... They took care of the outbreak and the world's moving on just like it always does, Daniel said. So why keep us down here? Why keep us alive at all? I asked. Matthew shrugged and rested his head on the wall. We all sat in silence for a moment before I softly said, I wonder how Ma's doing. Matthew's eyes came over to me and he placed his hand on my shoulder. I'm sure she's fine. Matthew said softly. He coughed, and then I coughed. My throat felt tight and itchy. 
I looked over at Daniel, who had started coughing as well. It was then I noticed how gray the air looked. I walked closer to the steps and I could smell the smoke. I made my way up the wooden steps. I was face to face with the door. I took a moment and then I started pounding on it. William! Ruby! I shouted. My hand continued to pound on the door. William, open up! I shouted. I could hear Matthew and Daniel quickly coming up behind me. We all started coughing as the smoke seemed to be pushing faster into the room. William! I shouted. Matthew pulled me aside as he started slamming his hands onto the door. Ruby, open this fucking door! Matthew shouted. Yet there was no answer, no sound whatsoever. All that could be heard were our heartbeats and the door as it shook under Matthew's fist. Open the fucking door! Move, Daniel said. With those words, Matthew and I took a step back and allowed the mountain that was our older brother to make his way toward the door. His hand took hold of the doorknob and he shook it for a moment. It's warm, he said. Then he took a step back and lowered his shoulder. I watched as his shoulder went slamming into the thick wooden door. One violent ram after another was sent by Daniel. We all knew what this moment meant. If they weren't responding to this, then they were gone. We heard the wood start to split, and then Matthew joined in on the attack. One giant ram later, and the door went flying open. Daniel and Matthew hit the floor just as fast as the black smoke hit our nostrils. It was filling the house but it was clear that the fire was upstairs. I stepped over them and started toward the staircase. Where the hell are you going? Daniel shouted. I'm gonna go get Ma. Don't be dumb. I heard both my brothers calling my name, but I continued on. I closed my eyes slightly because the heat and smoke were causing them to burn. I felt my way to Mama's room, and when my hand hit the doorknob, I quickly pulled it back. The metal was burning hot. Ma! I shouted. I started to kick the door. I didn't know what to expect. I wasn't even sure what I was doing. I just knew she needed me. I kicked the door one more time and it pushed open and then my heart stopped. The bed was engulfed in flames and the room was quickly following behind it. Adam! Matthew shouted. He grabbed a hold of me as I fought to run into the room. Ma! I screamed. Sweat poured down my face as the flames made their way toward the door. Matthew kept dragging me back, pulling me down the hall. It was a back and forth fight until Daniel came and tossed me over his shoulder. I kept screaming, Ma! all the way down the steps. We made it to the front door, but it wouldn't move. It was bolted shut from the other side like Ruby said. What the fuck are we going to do? Matthew asked. Daniel tossed me down on the floor and he bashed his elbow through the window knocking out the glass. He started pushing the shards of glass onto the floor. He turned around to look at us. Blood was running down his arm as he shouted, Move your asses! We all went through the window one by one. I was last, and as I coughed and stared at the staircase, I honestly thought of just staying there and letting the flames take me too. My eyes went toward the kitchen, and I could see a pool of blood with two bodies lying among the red. One was Zombie Travis, all burned and freakish looking. The other body was Pa. I could tell from the gold watch that was still on his wrist. They might have done the deed, but it was his sons that truly killed him. I turned and hopped through the window. When I came through on the other side, I saw Matthew and Daniel standing there staring out at the driveway. I took a step closer and I could see them. Ruby and William, sitting on the hood of Pa's Mustang, with a front row seat to watch our home burn. Damn, y'all got out faster than I thought, William said before pointing his weapon at us. Maybe you were right, sis. We should have started the fire on the first floor. Told you, Ruby replied. I pushed past my brothers and pointed at her. How could you do that to her? Ma had nothing to do with this. How could you, Ruby? I shouted. Ruby stared at me and rolled her eyes before sliding off the hood of the car, clapping her hands slowly. You're cute. It's sweet how you think the world works, she said. Matthew took a step forward and Ruby sighed. Thinking you could just walk around here like a gift? 
without letting me take a peek inside? What the hell are you going on about? Daniel shouted. You three have been down there for a damn near a day. He didn't tell you the juicy details about what he did? All the shit he said before he raped me? Ruby shouted. I'm sorry for what Pa did to you, but we... But Ma! She didn't have anything to do with that! I shouted. Pa? William said. Your daddy was a snake who thought he could pay me to keep my mouth shut, Ruby said. William started walking towards us with his M4 aim. He thought because y'all had money that it was going to solve everything. Like it could give back what you took from me, Ruby screamed. Then I heard it. It wasn't a whisper, more like a dirty cat call you heard in the middle of the night from some drunk frat boys. You know you liked it. Matthew said, and I took a step back. What? I said softly, and Matthew looked at me. There was a small smile on his face, and then he looked back at Ruby. You loved it, Ruby. I don't know what all this stuff is really about, but it ain't about that, Matthew said, and then we watched as the red dot moved to the middle of Matthew's chest. You raped me, Ruby screamed. And now you're gonna pay, William shouted. A loud blast was heard, but it wasn't the one I expected. Mama's window exploded, sending glass flying. It was only a small moment that delayed William's reaction by a second, but it was all Daniel needed as he rushed William, picking him up into the air and slamming him down onto the ground. The two of them rolled back and forth on the lawn. Get off him, Ruby shouted. I looked over at Pa's car to see the handle of an M4 sticking up from the passenger seat. Ruby's hazel eyes fell on me, and then they darted over to the car. Next thing I knew, we were both racing toward it. I was just a second faster as I pulled out the rifle and pointed it at her. Back the hell up! I shouted. Ruby's hands went up, and she slowly started taking steps backwards. I turned the muzzle of the gun towards William and Daniel. All right, that's enough! I shouted, but they kept rolling, so I fired a warning shot into the air and the pair came to a quick stop. Matthew walked over to them, picking up William's M4. Get over there by your brother, I said softly. You all right? Matthew asked. Yeah, Daniel said. They both walked over toward me. I kept my red dot on Ruby and Matthew kept his on William. You don't have to do this. I told you... All we want is him, Ruby said. I looked over at Matthew and then looked back at Ruby. Well, you can't have him, I said. I felt Matthew's eyes on me. Was he proud? Was he happy that his little brother was standing up for him? I don't know. I don't think I'll ever know what goes on inside his head. You killed my father and my mother, I said softly. And now... You got to pay for your sins, I said. Any last words? Matthew asked. William's hands were up along with Ruby's. He smiled and nodded. Yeah, just one. How did that stew taste? William asked. Ruby's head turned to look at him. Was it sweet? Maybe something Mama would make? William said as he started laughing. What the fuck are you laughing at? Daniel yelled. You ate your mama! William shouted. You ate your mama! His words still wake me up in the middle of the night. That crazed scream. I can't get it out of my head. Matthew pulled the trigger and sent a bullet flying into William's head. Ruby jumped and looked over at me. Please, Adam! She cried and I pulled the trigger. I watched her body fly back and tumbled over into the ground. I should have turned my rifle on him or myself. If I was a real man, I would have done that a long time ago. But I'm more like my dad than I like to admit. I'm a coward who just wants to do right by his family. Daniel said, I ain't been right since then. He said, I'm broken. And maybe I am. 
We loaded up in the car and drove off. I didn't tell anyone this because I guess I felt I owed her something, but I saw Ruby get up. I don't know what happened to her, but I hope she's doing better than we are. I hope she got away from the sin. Daniel said he had some buddies down by Fort Gordon that could help us out, but the car crapped out on us before then. We ended up coming across this nice traveling circus. They took us in. Might be why we still keep them around. I think about putting a bullet in them, but then I see all those people who saw three lost men and took pity on them. They didn't have to do that, so I just can't kill them. Daniel doesn't do it because Matthew tells him not to. Matt says they come in handy. He says they're good at scaring people. Girls, they're good at scaring girls. And Matt, well, he likes the fear. I'm sorry, I'm going on and on. I'm sure you three just want to know why you're hanging upside down over these buckets. I wish I could tell you it's a joke. That this is all to scare you and you'll be okay. You almost feel like a deer right now, wanting to turn tail and run. But you can't, because I won't let you. I'm the only thing stopping you, so in a way, I'm like the hunter's bullet. Y'all are gonna die here. It's gonna be painful and bloody. They're gonna do some really bad things to y'all. So, I just thought instead of hanging here and wondering what's gonna happen next, I'd keep you entertained with some stories. What was that? No, I'm sorry, I can't remove your gag. Matthew'd be really mad at me. He runs the show now. He's the ringmaster. I hope you enjoyed Adam, written by Sylvester Barzi and performed by Paul J. McSorley. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>